Welcome to the Best Business Podcast, the podcast for established marketers, entrepreneurs, and CEOs. The ones who want to join me in my mission to create 200 new multimillionaires who solve world problems with entrepreneurship. If that's you, then this podcast was created to give you access to the tools, training, strategies, and tactics you need to achieve multiple seven-figure profits as soon as possible. This world needs the best business you can build, so please get ready, open your mind, believe you can do this, and let's build a better world together for future generations. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always, and today we are speaking with Todd Brown. Todd has an uncanny ability for transforming ordinary Monday marketing campaigns into grand slam money makers. His unique marketing funnel strategies, tactics, and copy hacks have generated tens of millions of dollars for himself, his clients, and many of his coaching students. He's the creator of several training programs, including marketing, the Marketing Funnel Automation Program, the Marketing Funnel's Uncensored Newsletter, the Six Figure Funnel Formula, and 26 Advanced Marketing Funnel Conversion Tactics. He's worked with Jay Abraham, Michael Masterson, Clayton Makepeace, John Carlton, Mike Philsame, Russell Brunson, Frank Kern, Chris Brisson, and Ryan Dice, if any of those names mean anything to you. He's also a highly sought-after speaker and has been on stages with Michael Gerber and Brian Tracy, among other notable professionals. Many people know him through his work with Strategic Profits, where he worked alongside Rich Sheffrin, a highly respected entrepreneur known to have made over $3 million in only seven days. Todd Brown, for many, is the go-to guy for creating wildly profitable marketing funnels. Why a marketing funnel? What is a marketing funnel? Well, if you don't know, a marketing funnel is a step-by-step -step strategic system for turning eyeballs into leads and then customers. And if you want to play like the big boys, then a single phenomenal front-end marketing funnel could revolutionize your business. Business. It could revolutionize your business by allowing you to generate new customers that break even, even meaning you spend $1,000 and you get $1,000 worth of new customers. When you get that, you've just reached the promised land because it's no longer about marketing. It becomes a scale issue. Now, a heads up, this call has nothing to do with any get-rich-quick fluff. Uh, Todd is a firm believer that there's no fast way to sustainable riches in business. He's been in the game a long time and knows there's a big difference between having an income stream or making money online and having an online business. I know I'm super excited to finally be able to connect with him today. I've wanted to have this conversation for a long time now. Todd is someone I've not had the pleasure of meeting in person yet, but we have something like 250 mutual friends on Facebook, and I've been a fan of his from a distance for a long time. One thing that I do know is we both agree, in order to have a sustainable business, you have to have a rock-solid marketing funnel that allows you to pay for traffic and do paid media and break even on that. So I present to you the man himself, Todd Brown. Todd, thank you for joining us today. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, man. That was an awesome introduction. It made me sound a lot cooler than what I really <laughs> am, man. But that is awesome. I love how you nailed, uh, and I know you and I are, on, are, are in total agreement, um, the whole premise of building a real business online and not seeking out the fast buck or anything like that and doing it through uh, strategic marketing. And so, man, yeah, I'm excited to be here with you, dude. Thanks, man. Thank you. And, you know, you've got like like a huge list of accomplishments and just, you know, I, one of the things I love about marketing is it's so diverse and it's an extremely powerful skill. But you obviously weren't as good of a marketer as you are today back in the day. So how did you even kind of first get started? Yeah, that's an awesome story, man. So I was working in uh, in the health club industry. I was working for a company in New Jersey that owned, uh, at the time, about 10 upscale health clubs. And I was responsible for one of the departments in the um, – in the entire company, uh, a department that was responsible for generating, um, you know, money. So we were generating <laughs> about three million dollars a year, mm -hmm. and uh, and so at the time I knew nothing about direct response marketing, copy, anything like that. When I thought of advertiser, or really I should say, when I thought of marketing, I thought of advertising. You know, Coca Cola and and the big brand institutional uh, messages that most people associate with uh, with advertising. And so one day in the mail, I received uh, like a direct response postcard from um, some dude who was selling a marketing and sales system for um, the fitness industry. And so he was charging about 399 bucks for it. I went to the owner. I said, Hey, I want to buy this and you know, I'm going to expense it. I, I it looks kind of interesting. He said, cool, go ahead. I got it. 
Um, it was a big, gigantic home study course. I had never seen anything like that before. And I, I dove in and immediately I was just enamored with this whole idea of salesmanship and print and kind of leveraging your marketing and, and, and sales skills through copy and through offer creation and whatnot. And so I immediately picked up the phone. I called the dude who created it and I said, who did you learn from? And he said, Dan Kennedy. And uh, and so I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit that I immediately went out and ordered everything Thing I could on eBay <laughs> uh, from Dan, so all these cassette tapes and yep. and, and everything, and that. um, <laughs> and yeah, and that, uh, and I actually still have those. I saved them kind of as like you know uh, mementos of those early days, and uh, and yeah, and so that was my introduction into the direct response world, and so I began implementing what we were, uh, what I was learning in in the in the company. Um, my department skyrocketed. I became like the poster child for the executive team at the company and uh wow. and yeah it was just uh, amazing and then i i got the bug um to kind of share what it is that we were doing in the in the health clubs and you know we took a, a bunch of what i learned and we tweaked it to make it fit mm -hmm. and so i decided that i wanted to create my own information product but not not for the fitness or health club arena just because i didn't want there to be a conflict of interest with the the owner mm -hmm. and so i decided to launch an information product um for massage therapists because we were working with massage therapists and chiropractors and, and whatnot and um and that was the beginning uh the beginning of the end of my uh time as an as an employee uh because it was just amazing and awesome and and uh but I, I will say this man i remember very very clearly this has been now maybe 13 years ago um, I remember very clearly what it was like starting off and I only I didn't know anything about tech I I, I just knew how to send an email um, and I remember you know sitting at the computer and hitting refresh on my email see, waiting for a sale to come in and and all that but yeah man that was my introduction into the world of direct response and information publishing well, that's definitely um, a path that a lot of people follow. A lot of people learn stuff from Dan Kennedy. It's funny how you said that you were embarrassed, though. Why were you embarrassed? Just because you went on eBay instead of buying it from Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Like I've always felt, you know, like I mean since then I, I've gone on and, and, and spent a bunch of money with Dan. But yeah, just embarrassed that like I always felt like after like I should just send him a check for, you know, just <laughs> right. to make up for all the money that I paid other people for, for, his, uh, stuff. for his stuff. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like a music question as well when you get to that because now – the internet that's something that um comes up a lot like how do we protect information what's the value of information now because it can be so easily accessible um it's yeah. kind of a bit off topic but what are some of the ways that you guys are trying to battle that because i know that that's a big thing in the industry overall yeah i think that's a great question man and it's an interesting topic um i don't you know i, I really believe and i i, I think I, I don't remember who i first heard this from or where I first learned this from, but I really don't try to get caught up in, you know, the, um, that side of the business, we, we, we take measures, of course, to protect our content, um, uh, you know, of course, especially our paid trainings and programs and whatnot. We take all the measures that we can, but beyond that, I don't get, um, crazy about trying to, uh, lock everything down, you know, to the point where it, be, it it then impacts the the client experience or the customer experience. I just believe, man, that you know, like I can be. Um, I can be more prolific. I can create content, quality content faster than they can, um, than it can get out. And so I just try not to get caught up in, you know, I feel like, man, you got to be so careful with the internet that you're not getting wrapped up in, um, the haters, yeah. in trolls, in, you know, because man, very quickly you can, that stuff can wreak havoc on your psychology and, uh, and your motivation. And so. Yeah, I don't do a whole lot, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. I just asked because you've been in the game a heck of a lot longer than I have, and so you've seen different, like, you've seen kind of the seasons come and go, so to speak. Yeah. What are some of the other things that have kind of stand, stood the test of time, at least, or things that, um, I, I guess I'm changing topics here, but just because I asked you that, and that's part of why I asked that, because I thought maybe you'd be able to say something about how it evolved, but that's totally fine, because I, I agree with you on that, that you're better, I mean, that's Ray Kroc, it's like, if you're not leading with marketing innovation 
and then you're falling behind, right? Because exactly yeah. that. You can't – it's really hard to protect. And even if you trademark your stuff, now you have to – you know, now you have to fight it and it's just a big – like it's just loss of focus. So yeah. what have been some of the things that you've seen in, like you said, the 13 years that have really stood the test of time that are just – quintessential things that have really helped you be successful? Yeah, I think that's an awesome question, man. I, I think it's just this, and it, it's a big overarching kind of philosophy, if you will, that, that I function with on a, on a daily basis, as does the, the, the bulk of my, um, most of my team. And that is that um, I focus on strategy, not tactics. Mm-hmm. You know, the reality is that for most marketers, especially newer marketers online, they don't really even – I would go as far as to say that they don't really understand the implications of the difference between a tactic and uh, and a strategy, right? The reality is that, um, you know, tactics are the things that we do to execute on – the strategies, right? So for example, you know, using a countdown timer on your website, that's, that's an example of a tactic to, um, to leverage scarcity, urgency, um, you know, using Facebook comments on a web page underneath a video, right? That's a tactic for demonstrating social proof. The reality is that tactics come and go. There are things that tactically are effective today that won't be effective, uh, a year from now. Um, Um, And so I focus at least certainly when it comes to my education, my ongoing um, growth in that area and knowledge learning, I focus on strategy because strategies don't change, right? Like the thing, things like leveraging social proof that was effective, is effective and will remain effective. The thing that will change is how we actually execute tactically um, the demonstration of social proof. And so I think that, you know, it was my buddy, um, who you mentioned, Rich Sheffrin, brilliant marketer, brilliant entrepreneur, who first said to me many years ago, you know, we were having a conversation about the difference between the all-star marketers and the average marketers. And the discussion came to this point where it was like, look, the difference is not in the strategies, right? Like the the, the all-star marketers, we're still, you know, you're, we're still like you, me, we're, we're still using, um, you know, social proof and, and, and authority and commitment and consistency you know, Cialdini, you know, stuff, if you will. The difference is in how we actually execute those things tactically, whereas the the average everyday marketer will just use the common um, tactics, the things that they see everybody else using. The all-star marketer is constantly looking for new, different, and unique ways to tactically implement on those same strategies. And so, number one, I think that everybody listening to this, obviously you've got a savvy audience right to be listening to because i've i've had the chance to listen to many of your podcast episodes and and so yeah and and really um you know enjoy your approach and perspective and i know that uh you know you attract quality individuals nobody on here should be studying tactics unless you are in the business of executing those like unless you have uh, an agency where you do facebook advertising you know you, you if you're studying the nitty-gritty details of facebook advertising the reality is that a year from now you're still going to be doing that because those tactics change and evolve. And so your marketing chops never really improve because you're still studying and mastering the same thing a a year later. Um, And that's why, like, if you look at my my bookshelf in, in my home office behind me, you'll find that the bulk of of marketing related books, especially, but the bulk of of the books are strategic. Right. And that's why many of the best books, best marketing books that all of your listeners should be reading, they're decades old, right? right? Breakthrough advertising and, and all of John Capel's books and Victor Schwab and Robert Collier, all these books that are decades and decades and decades old, yet they still apply today. Mm -hmm. That's because they're strategic, not tactical, right? I've never bought a book on how, you know, like a, especially a physical book on like how to do Facebook advertising, because the reality is by the time that thing hits your shelf, it's probably dated because it's, it is, um, it's tactical. Right. And, and so the last thing just very quickly that I'll say is everybody on here before they go and they, they swipe a, uh, a marketing tactic, 
from a, an expert or a quote unquote guru, whatever you want to call it, you've got to make sure that you understand the strategic reason why that tactic is being used. Because the example that I like to give all the time is, you know, you take the average marketer who's just getting started, he or she goes over, sees somebody like you, Daryl, that is, let's say, using, you know, the Facebook comment widget uh, somewhere in your marketing funnel. And they go and they say, okay, so I need to have a Facebook comment widget somewhere in my funnel. And so they they see that this that you have 150 comments below a video in your funnel. And so they take the comment widget and they drop it on their page, but now they have three comments. And they don't realize that the whole reason why you're using that Facebook comment widget is to, to execute or demonstrate the, the strategy of social proof. And now they have three comments. And so if anything, they have reverse or negative right. social proof and they just shot themselves in the foot. They're using the same exact tactic, but strategically they just, they just killed themselves. And so strategy, not tactics. Yeah. And that's a really, really, really important thing to say, because I say that often you can't build a house just by looking at it from outside and trying to model it. You know, like it's just not going to work. And that's why that's why we get coaches and consultants in that, because we need to know the inside details. And I, I know exactly what you mean, because I've heard of people that their businesses go belly up when no longer they can't get 10 cent clicks anymore, you know, yeah. and they can't afford this really super cheap advertising. And of course, we all want cheap advertising. But the reality is like what you said, it's not it's strategically, that's not what you really want to focus on. If your business is focused on free or cheap traffic, you're never going to be able to get off the ground, you know, and that's yeah. a huge. I think that's a really, really, really important, um, really important tidbit that you told our, our listeners. I hope some people are taking notes and writing this down. Yeah. Even the even the whole idea, man. Just since you know you mentioned it, even the whole idea of you know these marketers that go on, let's say Facebook or whatnot, and they post, you know, hey, I'm getting you know ten cent clicks. It's it's amazing. It's incredible. Um, and I, you know the reality is that like you know a lot of marketers don't even recognize the fact that you know who cares if you're getting ten cent clicks if those clicks are worth seven cents to you. Right. Like, right. in other words, you know, like it's not, you know, like to me, you know, there are certain things when I, I think they just don't understand in some cases, not all by any stretch. Right. Because there's tons of savvy marketers out there. But I think when I it, it, it saddens me when I see newer marketers that are focused on something like getting cheap clicks, but they don't understand the overall strategy of direct response marketing that the real game is in being able to afford the most uh, per click, mm. not the least, right? Like right. you want to impress me, tell me that you're you're getting you know five dollar clicks and you're thrilled because every click is worth at least five dollars or more to your business. Then I'm going to be impressed. And so, um, yeah, it saddens me when I see that. No, but that's a really good and it's an important topic and it's something that's come up a couple of times on these calls because there's some recurring themes. When we talk to people. There's one of having a really good team around you, and there's another one of being able to market pay to market your business i mean yeah. that's huge i mean that's why so many businesses don't scale at all that's why a lot of small businesses fail because they get into a brick and mortar scenario and they can't afford to advertise and they just buy whatever marketing the first rep on their door shows up selling them and they spend a couple thousand dollars a thousand dollars on that and it doesn't work and then so they they're stuck trying to grow via word of mouth yeah. and that's just a painful way to grow and you're never going to have a real business if that's how you grow and prosper so maybe can you talk about that a little bit more just about being able to afford that and how do you even know i mean that's the other part i know i know the answer but i'd love to hear your perspective on that yeah i, I think that's a brilliant question and you know if there was one other kind of breakthrough mentally that um that i had that i hope all of your listeners have if they haven't already is this idea that um if you can't afford to pay for the acquisition of customers you don't really have a business right like i know that it was um you know i've been blessed and fortunate down here in South Florida to be um, surrounded by some incredible marketers uh, and, and entrepreneurs and business people. And so I had the opportunity really to, to first get some you know mentoring from Mark Ford, Michael Masterson, the guy behind uh, Agora, you know, a half a billion dollar a year information marketing, you know, giant, the biggest information uh, or the biggest newsletter publisher today in the world. Uh -huh. Um and, you know, he was the guy that really opened my eyes to the fact that, like, 
you know, security, stability, consistency um, in your business only comes from the ability to acquire customers um, from paid traffic. You know, and so first and foremost, let me just say this, that um, – that the whole name of the game, first and foremost, the whole na- name of the game, the priority for everybody listening before you, you know, outfit your office with a, with a, a great chair and, and all, you know, business cards, any of those type of things. Your first main priority is um, setting up a, a conversion vehicle or what you and I refer to as a, a marketing funnel. Uh, and we could certainly and should certainly talk about what I call – why I call it a marketing funnel and not a sales funnel uh, later on if you want. Sure. But it, the priority is being able to set up this conversion vehicle that allows you to consistently acquire customers from paid traffic. Until you can do that, nothing else is more important. You have to be able to put in a dollar into paid traffic on the internet um, and extract out a dollar – uh, in the form of a sale, you know, new customers and uh, and and prospects. So when you mentioned in your introduction the idea of break even, that's where we focus with all of our clients, our you know our coaching students, and that's where we focus in our own business. On the front end, all the marketing that we do with prospects, with the aim of turning a prospect into a customer, our goal is to be able to put in a dollar, ten dollars, or a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, whatever that number is. Our goal is to be able to turn that thousand into a thousand dollars. Of, uh, of of sales uh, of new customers uh, and prospects, um, uh, right, you know, on the front end, as right. soon as possible, right? right? When you're when you're able to do that, right? You know, like you're acquiring customers for free, you're acquiring leads for free, yeah. right? And so um, that's number one. And you know, you are to answer your second, the second part of the question, right? Like. You, that's why everybody on this call, everybody who uses direct response marketing, the beauty is that everything is quantifiable and trackable. So anytime you spend a dollar on a particular – on a Facebook ad, let's just say, well, you need to have your tracking in place that shows you what is the ROI of that dollar. So for that $1 that you put into that Facebook ad, how, how many dollars did you make back? Hmm. And um, that's on the front end. That's the whole name of the game. And I think you said it best. The reality is that most marketers just can't do that. Yeah. Most marketers don't have a funnel in place that allows them to extract out uh, a dollar for every dollar that they put in. They actually are forced to go negative on the front end. And so for most, it's just not sustainable and they can't do it. No, and that's and that's huge because every business, everybody knows, first of all, I think there's two key things in business. First of all, everybody knows you need new customers to have a business. So you have to be able to meet new people. And if it costs you money to meet more money to meet new people than you make off of meeting those people, then you're not going to be able to do that very long. And so that's right. just like fundamentally, that's just, right, that's flawed. But then the second thing a lot of people don't realize, because I know some of these people are listening, they're like, great, but you spent a 1000 Todd, and you made a $1,000, but like you broke even, so what? But I think a lot of people might not even realize that the value is in the regular customers. Everyone knows that you need regular customers to grow and sustain a business, but no one is, a lot of people, like I go to, one of my pet peeves is I'll go to a restaurant, I'll spend a couple hundred dollars on some food, and I leave, and the restaurant owner has no idea who I am, no idea where I live, no, like nothing. I just gave them a couple hundred dollars. I walk away and they're, you know, they have a slow Thursday night and they're going to what? They're going to put an ad in the newspaper and market to people who have no idea who they are. And so that's kind of the two parts. And I, I, I'm hoping this maybe segues, segues into what you talk about the marketing funnel and why it's not just a sales funnel. Am I, am I hitting it at all? Is that any, at all? Yeah, I, I think so. I think first and foremost, you know, just to address what you said, I think that it, it's the difference between the way the typical mom and pop entrepreneur um, operates from the way the 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 savvier um, direct response marketer operates the typical mom and pop entrepreneur they don't differentiate between front end and back end They're, the the purpose of every single transaction for your average entrepreneur is to generate profit whether that's the first transaction with a brand new prospect you know brand new customer or the twelfth transaction in their mind the the objective of each of those transactions is identical and that's to generate profit whereas the seasoned uh, uh, or savvy direct response marketer understands that you know that there is value in a customer. There's value in a buyer that isn't necessarily um, there in a prospect. And so we look at 
marketing under two main broad categories. We've got front end and back end. Front end is all the marketing, like I said, that you do um, with prospects. And the goal is, right, to turn those prospects into customers. Now, our goal on the front end is maximum customer acquisition. It's not maximum profit. It's not even profit. It's maximum customer acquisition. Now, when I start clients off, I always start them off with that means being willing to go to break even, meaning you put in a thousand, you get back a thousand, um, but now you have customers and leads and and um, and so on. That's where the back end comes in, and the back end is all the marketing that you do with existing customers. And in the the you know when when you're in business, the savvy direct response marketers understand that all the profit in your business is on the back end, right? The most expensive. The most expensive activity in any business is the front end, and that's because you've got all those acquisition costs, right? It costs you a certain amount of money to acquire a customer. Most businesses don't even realize how high their acquisition costs are. They don't realize that, right? If they spend a thousand dollars and hypothetically acquire um, five new customers from that thousand, they don't realize that it actually costs them two hundred dollars to acquire a single new customer. Yeah. And so, when you're able to acquire customers for free, meaning you're breaking even on the front, the beauty is that the second transaction, the third transaction, the fourth transaction, that's all profit because you don't have those acquisition costs. Of course, minus any cost of delivery on the on the product. And so, yeah, we differentiate and and segment. Customers receive, you know, customers get put into customer funnels for products that are, you know, products and offers that are back end and prospects go through uh, marketing funnels that are designed to, um, again, to acquire maximum number of customers. And so there are certain types of offers and certain type of sequences that we only use on the front end. You know, you hear like, for example, you know, you hear, let's say, you know, a, a common common vernacular in, in the IM, in the Internet marketing community is the tripwire, right, which right. came out of, you know, from Ryan, Ryan, uh, Ryan Dice, and um, who's a friend and, and, you know, massive respect. I tip my hat to him. Oh, but yeah. the, rea- the reality is what most people don't understand is that a tripwire is only an offer, which is a, an ultra low priced offer, right? It's right. a low barrier of entry offer. That should only be presented to a prospect. You should never be presenting a tripwire offer to a customer because the whole reason for using a tripwire and and the upsell sequence that is attached to it is to acquire a, a, um, a customer, is to be able to afford to pay for the acquisition of a customer. Once you have a customer, there's no value in exposing them to a tripwire, right. right? It's at that point that customers then get exposed to different products and different offers, different products and offers that are designed to um, generate profit and maximize the lifetime value of that customer to your business, meaning to increase the value of what a customer is worth to your business through multiple and additional back-end offers. Right. You know, that's awesome. You, like, read my mind, which just goes to show you in marketing savvy, because I was going to ask, what's the difference between the front-end and the back-end offer? And that's a great tip. And also just to say that Ryan's Ryan, he is a brilliant marketer. And tripwires are nothing new, and this is in no way disrespect to Ryan, a massive respect like you. Tripwires are nothing new. It's a front-end offer. It's a loss leader. It's a front-end offer. But I love how you differentiated that because it's exactly what he intended that purpose for. One, yeah. it was brilliant. You're on stage in front of, you know, 3,000 marketers and he seeded uh, lingo into the industry which is now permeated to we're to even you know what I mean like it's even yeah. here which is a brilliant marketing move on his part but I love how you differentiate that it's your tripwires are just low end product offers just that make it easy for someone to buy and that's because a lot of people are scared to spend money if they there's no relationship right all things being equal people want to do business with their friends all things not so equal people still want to do business with their friends and if they never spent money with you then they're really afraid to spend money with you so I really love how you differentiated that that provides clarity for myself as well cool. um, that's a great trip that's a great great tip and you said that was something that you learned from studying under like with agora yeah that was um really um that came from two people really uh, so let me give credit where credit's due so first you know mark ford you know michael masterson um and the second individual is clayton Makepeace. and clayton is you know one of the he's one of the greatest living copywriters today he's a guy that you know he generates over a million dollars a year from a single, like from one client alone um, in copywriting royalties. And the way Clayton first kind of shared it with me, and, and it's something that I pass on all the time to clients, is that it's, you know, on the front end, you, on the front end, 
let's say let's say a prospect comes into a particular funnel for a particular product and they don't buy that they don't buy right so they're still a prospect okay so on the front end we we're we move people horizontally meaning so we'll we'll make them an offer for a front end product whether it's $19 $29 $49 whatever the price point is is insignificant if they don't buy we're going to give them the opportunity to buy a different front end product right and we're going to continue to move them horizontally until we put out a product in front of them that really resonates with them and that they um, that they buy. Mm-hmm. But once they buy and they become a customer, they're no longer moved horizontally, um, meaning they're no longer presented with other $19, $29, $49 offers. Now we move them vertically. Mm-hmm. And so now we bring them through an ascension process where – you know, we're going to look to now turn them into a more valuable customer or client by giving them more value through um, higher price point, higher touch, more in-depth programs, products, services, et cetera. I love that. Yeah, that's great. And that's the Ascension Funnel. So once they prove themselves and they become a buyer and they enter your buyer's list, you're trying to turn them into a multi-buyer and move them up the funnel. Todd, what are your thoughts on price jumps? Because I've heard different people say different things. Some people say that, you know, you never want to go more than three times what they've paid before and scale them slowly. Some people are like, forget it. And Matt, like, you know, what, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I'm gonna. That, that's a um, a hot topic for me. So I'll talk. I'll, I'll I'll answer that within a specific context. So typically, when marketers are taught, um, you know, this idea of upselling, right? And when you know, marketers are taught like, look, so. Today, you know, this wasn't in place years ago. Like years ago, I didn't. We didn't have the ability to do one-click um, upsells, one-click add-on add-on offers. I think that 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 whole technological advancement radically changed the game for what um, you know what is now feasible to present as a front-end offer, right? Because the reason why you can do a tripwire today and still make that um, and still be able to break even is not because of the tripwire or your conversion rate on the tripwire, but it's because of the additional upsells and. And, and whatnot that you're gonna that you're gonna make to increase the transaction value. But here's the thing: so what most marketers are taught as it relates to upselling is they're taught, like you said, the typical three times model. So they're taught, like, look, if somebody comes in and somebody spends fifty bucks with you, forty nine dollars, that the next offer that you should make them right away in that upsell sequence in that upsell path is priced up to about one hundred and fifty bucks. Well, my take on that is um, – and this is from testing, massive testing and um, and tons of experience with funnels obviously as you know – that that is ridiculous. It's ridiculous because where in the world of commerce – and I want your listeners to think about this for one second. Where in the real world of commerce can you go – and will you be offered something immediately after you just bought one thing that is three times the price of what you just bought? Nowhere. You go buy you go and you buy a men's suit for three thousand dollars. You're offered a shirt for three hundred, you're offered a belt for eighty, you're offered a pair of shoes for, for two hundred. Right? You you know, all these marketers that teach upselling with the three times pricing model, they'll almost always start off the, the discussion, the training by using McDonald's. And they'll say, like, when you go through McDonald's, what do they ask you? You want fries with that, or you want a whatever upside biggie size it or whatever it is, right? Um, but the reality is that they're not using the three times pricing model you're buying a meal for for six bucks or whatever it is and they'll ask you do you want to you want to biggie size it or whatever for two bucks or you want to add fries for you know a dollar and so the reality is that that doesn't fall within the realm of typical consumer experience that three times pricing model what does fall within the realm of consumer experience is what i call an add-on and typically the very first offer that we use in that sequence is what I call a reverse add-on. And a reverse add-on is an offer that adds additional value, meaning it, it, it either gives them what they need next in their journey or it makes what it is that they just bought. Um, it gets them the results faster, easier, quicker, all that. But it's up to 80% of the price of the product that they just bought, up to 80%. So typically what – this is why we'll typically see um, take rates on those offers in you know, the mid to high 40 percent, meaning you know, anywhere from four to five people will take advantage of it because it becomes a no-brainer, right? They just buy something for um, 
for uh you know for 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 49 bucks and now you offer to them the ability to add something on to their their offer for uh for $29 it becomes a no brainer right if it gives them more value and 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 so on and so forth and so um right and the psychology my- there is great because if they just spend 49 bucks what's 20 Right. You know, whereas instead of you're trying to get them to buy a 300 product, it's like it's like you're taking more. It almost right. makes you think about how. Forgive me if I'm interrupting at all, but I just wanted to. While well, I was thinking about like lead pages, that one of the things that really surprised me is they talked about taking pages and giving pages. I saw Chris speak at one of the internet marketing parties, um, some before some conference, and I was really impressed by that because he said that that they feel that when you have your form and and of course you're always going to test and every situation is different, but that's why all, almost all their pages have you have to click to get the form to pop up. Because if it was just there, it felt like it was taking, 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 whereas otherwise right. it was a giving. And what you just described, I'm like, that's so great from a psychological standpoint because I think you're right. If it's an upsell, 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 and it's like you're taking more, 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 right, as opposed to it, – it just seem, almost seems like, hey, look, I'll make this better for you. Just you know, give me another 10 bucks, you know, and I'll make your $49 thing way better than you could have thought. You know what I mean? Like I just yeah, really absolutely. love that. I really, really and there's, love there's that. And there's – if you want to get a little advanced for one second, I'll just say this, that there's additional – there's there's – even you know, there's additional benefits to pricing your your first add-on offer um, that way. One is, uh, um, of course, most people don't even associate this with their upsell sequence, as they would call it, and that is there's an inverse correlation between the number of of upsell or add-on offers that a new customer takes and refund rate. So the individual who takes two of your add-on offers. Um, your refund rate for those people is going to be substantially lower than the people who only take the primary uh, main front end product, right? So right off the bat, one of the reasons why we want to increase the take rate on um, the add-on offers um, is because we know that it reduces refunds, right? So I want to maximize the number of people that take advantage of that offer. See, whereas most marketers are simply thinking about average transaction value, what they're thinking about is I'm going to have an upsell in here like you know you have some marketers that go to the extreme and they say i'm going to have my you know i'm going to sell something for 50 bucks and then i'm going to make an upsell offer to every customer uh for 497 dollars right and in their mind they say i only need one person out of a hundred to take that offer for it to radically bump our average transaction value right and right and and so that's true okay However, what that means is that 99 out of 100 of your customers are only taking advantage of the very first product, right? Um, and um, and so the other thing is that when you're in the information business, right, I want those new customers to spend more time with me, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. I want them to hear my voice more. I want them to see more of my videos, read more of my content, right, because they bond quicker. The relationship is established quicker, which increases the the, the speed at which I can move them to the first back end offer, right, that right, a week later, five days later, whereas for the marketers that are going from a $49 product to the extreme of 497 99 out of 100 of their of their new customers are only being exposed to that very first front end product and that's it so right. now the back end is infinitely harder for them than it is for me and the final benefit is that um is that it it creates yes momentum going into the other offers so right i get a yes and then i get another yes from a substantial chunk of those new customers, whereas the the marketer who's going from 49 to let's say again 497, the overwhelming majority of their customers are immediately giving them a no. Right. So big big difference, mm-hmm. and the reality is that economically, because with the reverse add-on, you get um, substantially a much higher take rate that you still will bump average transaction value. The difference is that you're doing it only because you're getting, like I said, 40 plus percent of your customers to take advantage of that of that add-on, whereas the person who's going to the extreme, you know, is 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 getting much lower. And the the last thing that I'll say is the the idea that when when I hear people say like, you know, you can use, you know, price, you know, take your first upsell and price it at three times, and and you'll still get twenty to thirty percent of your of your customers to take it. Um, that's ridiculous. 
That's mm-hmm. most of the time, you know, most of the time marketers are not seeing that. They're, if they're pricing it at three times, four times, they're not seeing 30% of their customers take advantage of that offer. Todd, that is awesome. I hope everyone's taking notes. If not, you better go get yourself a pen right now. Pause this because Todd is dropping bombs. I mean, that's just, that was beautiful. That was really beautiful. Cool. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, no, man, I love it. And it just goes to show the experience you've got and the wisdom that you've had. So um, that is really very, very, very insightful. And that's something that I'm going to start testing as well, more of those. Now, do you believe in a limit on how many upsells? I know guys that they will do eight or nine upsells. They'll put it there just in case there's that one customer that'll go through it all. Do you think that there's like at some point it's too much? I've been through some like infomercial style. They drive you to a website and they want to, you know, that it's, it gets too much. And I, I don't know. It's very corporate looking, but I don't know if it converts very well. Um, but what do you feel? Yeah, I think that it depends on what the customer does. And so what I'll tell you is that when we get two no's in an add-on sequence, the sequence is done. So if somebody, you know, says no to the, you know, the first reverse add-on and then they they say no to um to the next offer, they're done, right? I'm not going to continue to hammer them through the sequence. What I will say is that um is that if you have a buyer though who is excited by what it is that they're being presented with, um sure, I'm going to I'm going to make additional offers. Except I don't think we ever go beyond 4. Like because I think it does, personally, I just think you reach a point where um, you're start like look right. If you go back to what we said at the beginning, where the front end is all about acquiring a customer, and the the goal is to um, to then develop a, a lifelong relationship. business relationship with them. I want to start that process, that experience off with the best experience that I can. And so sometimes you got to be willing to practice a little bit of delayed gratification, right? You know, and and put it off. But again, I will say that, like, look, if somebody is indicating to you interest, well, then it it does them a disservice if you're not giving them the opportunity to get all the value from you that they would ultimately want. Yeah, that's so that's very true. And I really agree with that. And I think you're right, because otherwise you're just trying to sell them stuff. You're not because, like you said, after four products, it's like, hey, man, what more do you really need to buy? You know, this is a restaurant. You order four meals. Like, look, you got to eat something first before I can sell you anything else. So, uh, I I yeah, and I think like at the fourth, you know, like if you get to the fourth um, (laughs) offer, like that should be your big daddy. Like, in other words, like you know, somebody's bought, you know, they they bought the front end, they bought the reverse add on. Then we go to typically like a a mid tier, you know, and if they buy that, I'm going to give them the the next offer that I'm going to present them is going to be the the big daddy, right? And if they want it, they take it. If they don't, then they're done, right? And so we're still giving them the opportunity to get maximum value from us but um you know i i think i think the key is when they when you get two no's take them out of that sequence yeah that's awesome that's a great 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 tip now what about marketing execution because i know a lot of people that they'll spend forever in the planning stage or they're afraid to pull the trigger or you know they're worried about things breaking or not working uh for you i mean when you're dealing with some of the campaigns that you've had to deal with the timelines and you know like how do you What's your philosophy or, or, or how do you approach the execution of it? Because, um, you know, there's so many people like I've, I've worked with a lot of people with clients at Infusionsoft and a lot of these campaigns never even see the light of day. And, it, yeah. you know, and is it is it because they're just afraid to put it out there? Is it because it's not ready? Do you like what do you think about that aspect and how do you push through that to really get your stuff out the door? And your stuff looks really good. Like I'm I'm definitely like envy. I'm like, dude, I don't know who his web guy is, but I need to steal him because your stuff just looks <laughs> so crisp and I mean that jokingly, of course, but you just, I appreciate, yeah, yeah, I appreciate that, man. I, I think that, so we break, we break the, the execution down into three phases and these three phases do not overlap with each other. And, and that's an, it's an important point that I'll come back to in just a second. So the first phase is engineering, right? And that's when we're actually kind of, let's just say, let's call it, we're setting up the funnel. Now, when we're an engineering, a brand new funnel, um, we're not engineering the entire funnel, meaning we're not engineer. You know, we're not setting up all the upsells and downsells and all the you know intelligence and and logic in there, uh, because we're trying to get to what what I call a minimum viable funnel, which is we're trying to get to a point where we can go to the market and 
test the premise behind the front end product, the main front end product, right? Because the reality is that if, you know, like, look, the, the upsell or add on offer sequence doesn't matter if nobody's converting, nobody's buying on the main offer, right? right? So before you worry about, you know, structuring the upsell sequence and, and, and all that, you want to go out and you want to test a minimum viable funnel. And we typically will do that, um, Typically, we do that with cold uh, with cold traffic, with paid traffic. Now, if for somebody that doesn't have um, the cash flow, then you can certainly start with your um, your your house list. Now, if your house list doesn't buy the product, if it's not converting, then you're you're never going to convert, uh, or the likelihood of converting with cold traffic, uh, you know, goes um, goes way down. But what we're ultimately doing is we're engineering a minimum viable funnel, and then we go and we immediately um, test it with cold traffic and of course we're tracking everything right so that we can see ROI now depending on that initial test and depending on the ROI um, we may go into the next stage which is optimization and optimization is when we begin implementing like depending on the ROI if we're close to break even well then I know that if we're close to break even that we're going to be able to implement the add on offer sequence and you know I can run the numbers in my head like using low low projections like what you know how will the economics of that of that funnel change and so at the optimization stage is when we begin to implement the add-on offers um and and when we go into our testing phase right that's when we're we we will look at the funnel we'll after we roll out the add-on offer sequence we'll then look at the funnel and we'll look at what i call the optimization metrics, which are things like um, opt-in rate, sales conversion rate, order form abandonment rate, and upsell take rate. And I look at it like I look at a, a chain. And I, I'm always looking when I look at that chain for the weakest link, right? Because like I say all the time, right, like everybody knows a, the strength of a chain is determined by the weakest link, link. Not, the, not the strongest link. It doesn't matter how, how many pounds the strongest link or the second strongest link can withstand. That chain is only as strong as the absolute weakest link. That's what, right, we call the constraint. And so we identify using our optimization metrics what is the constraint. And then when we – let's say the constraint is the opt-in page because you know opt-in rate is 7 percent or something crazy, right? So then we go to work testing um, and tracking the, um, the opt-in page. And the beauty of what we do in the direct response business, especially online, is that the, the reality is that the worst your funnel is ever going to perform is today. Right. Because, I love that. Yes. Right? I'm so glad you said that. I love that. Yep. Keep going. You know, <laughs> no, because then you know, we're able to just test new elements and, and, and eventually like, look. You might test, uh, you know, 10 new headlines um, and it only takes one of those to bump conversions for you to make progress. Mm -hmm. Then we look again and we see what's the constraint. Okay, the opt-in page is still the constraint. So we go and we continue to test and and we're incrementally improving um, the results until that opt-in page is no longer the constraint. Then we might see, okay, the order form abandonment rate is now the constraint. And so now we go and we continue that, that, that process. Now, what I will say is that there is a point where you can be operating within the second stage, optimizing the funnel, and the third stage. The third stage is scaling the funnel. And scaling is the easiest um, of, of the stages, and it's also the most exciting part. And, and it's really where once you're able to extract out a dollar for every dollar you put in, the name of the game becomes how many dollars can I put in on a daily basis, mm-hmm. right? And so at that point, it becomes, you know, I just, I want to, I want to scale my budget. That's really scaling a funnel is all, is more about scaling the volume of traffic that you're putting into the funnel. And in order to do that, we just scale up our budget. We go from, you know, a hundred bucks a day to, you know, 200 bucks a day to 500 bucks a day to as high as we can possibly go. And remember that for everybody that's listening, you're not starting out with $20,000 sitting in an account waiting to be used for, for marketing. Remember, we're, we're putting in 500 today or 200 today or a hundred today or 50 today, wherever you're starting. And our funnel is, is recouping that money 
plus customers, plus leads, and now we're taking that 50 or 100 bucks and we're putting it back to work for us tomorrow, doing the same. Right. And then the game, right? So your, your, your bank account has not gone down at all. Yep. You're recycling the same dollars over and over. Then it becomes, well, let me see if I could put in 200 today and, and recoup my ad spend. Okay, I can, so let me do it tomorrow. Let me, okay, now can I go to 300? And can I go to 400? And can I go to 500? And so it's this interesting perspective that you, you've got to, you've got to, the average marketer needs to shift from, right? It's this initially for most marketers, it's this idea of, well, how can I spend the least amount on traffic? How can I spend the least amount on, on marketing? Whereas the reality is that the savviest marketers, I look at it the complete opposite. Whereas I want to be able to spend the most amount that I possibly can every day because it's not an expense, Right. If I'm recouping it, I'm not I'm not there's no nothing. It's not like the cable bill or the, 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 the electric bill or the telephone bill. It is every time I put five hundred out there in the marketplace every day, I get five hundred dollars back plus customers plus leads. So now let me test a thousand dollars a day. Let me test fifteen hundred a day. And, you know, there was a point where like the most exciting days were, were when we were spending at points five thousand dollars a day. Yep. And like, you know, it wasn't like I had, you know, it wasn't like I, I, I dedicated 150,000 for the month in traffic. No, not, not at that. all. And you build up to it, that over time. Right. And yep. you build up to it over time. Even today, when I start out a new campaign, we start out at like a hundred bucks a day and, you know, like I'm not, you know, starting out at like a hundred dollars a day and that's it. Let that hundred dollars, uh, let me prove it with, you know, with a hundred dollars, right? Because like, look, you know, you don't start out with a thousand or five thousand or ten. You start out with a hundred bucks and let it prove itself and then recycle it and grow it. Wow. This is, this is definitely like a seminar and an audio and this has been great. And I, I, I love it. You've given really great answers. Either I agree with or things that I even hadn't even considered. So I love that. So your three stages was engineering where you just set up your basic viable model, just get it out there, see if it even works, see if people are even interested at all, test it with your cold traffic, track everything. Then the second stage was optimization where you take a look at your entire funnel here, the chain, and then you look at the weakest link. And do you test multiple things at once or do you really just focus on the weakest link first? I mean, I always... I always focus on the constraint because the way to look at it is like, let's say you have a five lane highway and that five lane highway then goes into, you know, one lane, you know, for, for half a mile. And then after that one lane, you know, or whatever, you, you know, one lane going each way. And then, it, and then it goes back to a five, a five lane highway. So in that example, the, 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 what's often called the bottleneck, which is really the same as the constraint is that section of the highway. That's, you know, only one lane. Well, Taking any other section of the highway, like if we take the five lane portion and we turn it into a six lane, it's not going to do anything because the bottleneck is still the the um, the bottleneck, right? right? And so we always focus one at a time on the constraint, right? Like because improving the like improving the upsell take rate isn't going to do. A, it's not really going to move the needle um, if the constraint is like the opt in page. And so we just always one at a time identify the constraint and eliminate it as the constraint, then go on to the next weakest link, right? And there's always at any one point, there's always in any process, there was there is always a constraint. It's your job as an uh, you know when you're optimizing to identify that constraint and focus your optimization efforts on fixing or opening up that bottleneck. That is so Awesome. Yeah. Todd, you have so much value to give. I want to keep you like, I just want to keep you here. What are you doing for the next couple hours? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, man. I hear you. Yeah, I, love, no, this I love this. This is why I do this. I mean, again, this is what inspired the podcast in the beginning. I had a buddy that said, Daryl, if I was able to sit down and have conversations like you have with some of the people, you know, I'd be doing million dollar funnels myself. And that's what really triggered it. And just even this conversation, I'm like, man, the people are listening to this for some of these people, it's going to be life changing. So um, just thank you for bringing that to the table and just not hiding anything and just, just being so forthcoming with it all. Um, it means a lot, you know, for, I mean, I know, I know for you, it's just about giving back. It's not going to change anything. No competitor is really going to be able to model and do what you do anyway. So it's not a big deal at all. So I just really, really value and appreciate that. Um, Todd, what are you working on these days? What's got you really excited? I'm seeing your ads all over the place. What do you got going on? 
Yeah, so we we just released a um, a, a program like a live um, training, so that you know mm-hmm. en- enrollment is closed. So it's, this is not a pitch for that, but this is extremely exciting for me, um, and it's on the topic of um, of smart funnels. And so without, I won't bore everybody with the, all of the background on um, on why this is like in in 2016 the big trend uh, online in, with online marketing marketing is going to be marketing processes, marketing methods that that dynamically interact with and adapt to uh, who the prospect is and what the prospect does um, as they're interacting with your your funnel and your and your marketing. So you know we're we're seeing this you know in um, in the world of apps, you know more customization, personalization. We're seeing this already with you know with of course retargeting, which most people should be at least somewhat familiar with, right? Retargeting, which today is uh, it provides some of the highest ROI of all paid uh, um, methods. And look, it's it's an example. It's a type of smart um, or more intelligence built into marketing, right? Uh, D- uh, displaying a particular ad to a particular product based on a uh, – excuse me, to a, a particular prospect for a particular product uh, based on a particular page or set of pages that a prospect has visited. Yep. And so, right, it's intelligence. It's not just a, you know, a generic general ad. It's a it's it's an intelligent um, advertising process, if you will. Mm-hmm. And so that's one little example. Now, there are companies like – I think it is um, – it's either progressive or priceline i can't even remember who today they looking at their metrics they were able to see that uh that visitors to their website that were on uh, that are on an iphone are better quality customers they respond to higher uh quality uh, deals than let's say visitors to their site with an Android device, That's and awesome. so today they have intelligence built in where if you go to their site on an iPhone, the deals that you're going to see are different from the deals that the Android users are going to see. So what it what it's allowed them to do is it fur it allows them to further monetize the quality of the iPhone visitor, and it allows them to bump conversions with the Android visitor, right? And so rather than simply just presenting a one size fits all deal or message to everybody they're using an intelligence and so what the training uh, um the training program um what that's all about is how you're able to build in that marketing intelligence through every stage of your funnel, even um, on a, your main site and blog. So, for example, like a simple example, and this is stuff that you know all of your you know your listeners can begin to be aware of and and, and conscious of, because most are already going through some level of uh, of a smart funnel or a smart marketing process. But it, a simple example is you know you've got an individual who goes to your blog for example, and they're interacting with a particular category of articles on your blog, well, it's the ability to display a sidebar that's targeted to that category of content. Mm-hmm. Or if they're on it, you know, if you have a golf blog, for example, and they're reading an article about golf attire, right? And so your sidebar is now dedicated to golf attire offers and, and you know, lead magnets, if you will, that are, that are directly linked to golf attire deals, a deal on shirts, a deal on hats, a deal on, you know, uh, um, shoes and, and, and so on. You know, it's the ability to, uh, to present a first visit incentive, a first visit offer to a prospect the first time they go to your sales page, right? Giving them an offer, especially offer that they only get on the first visit to uh, to that product page. It's the ability to use what I call dynamic offer stacking where somebody goes to your sales page a, a second time and you're able to have an additional bonus that they now get. Uh, and and that that's only being displayed to them because it's their second visit to the page or on the third visit to the page you're able to display um, a discount you know a deal a payment plan um, it's the ability to let's say have a delayed add to cart button on the first visit that when somebody goes to watch the VSL the first time uh, on the second time there is no delay anymore or you know on the second time when they go to watch the VSL they're able to pick up where they left off rather than simply forcing everybody to start from 
the beginning or if they go to a VSL page and they don't buy, they now go over to your blog and they're followed around your blog with what I call internal funnel retargeting. So now they see a banner on your own blog specific to that product that they didn't buy and the same thing happens it's fully coordinated externally where when they go to facebook they're retargeted with an ad to to bring them back and once they buy not only are they no longer externally retargeted or internally retargeted but maybe now internally there's an ad uh, uh, on your blog either uh there's a banner for them to access their product or and then three days later you know if they come back there's now a banner that's displayed for them to take advantage of your first back end Right, it's it's an adaptive, interactive um, process that gives every prospect, every visitor, a customized experience based on what they're doing, not doing, what they're consuming, what they're not consuming, and so on. And so, in 2016, you're going to see um, massive, massive steps with that. You're already seeing it now, and you're certainly going to see more advancements at the end of 2015. But the beauty is that technology that was once only available to the big companies is now in- available to us smaller players. And so, it's allowing for some incredible uh Incredible stuff. Like we're already seeing, um, you know, dynamic VSLs, you know, video sales letters where you, you're actually able to interact with it. And based on your answers, it brings you down a different path, right? So, you know, you're talking to men and women and, you know, they, you know, tell me, are you a man or are you a woman? And they say, I'm a woman. And it brings them down, same VSL, but right. now it brings them down a totally different path than if they were a man. All housed within the same VSL, all dynamic, responsive, interactive, the whole nine. You couple that with some of the examples that I just showed you of smart funnel or marketing intelligence, and yeah, and, that, and that's why marketers are now seeing conversions creep up into the double, you know, the low double digits, and uh, and so that's what I'm most excited about. Which is super exciting, man. That's super exciting because really, you mentioned at the very beginning of the call about salesmanship in print, which is basically leverage salesmanship. It's the ability to sell to more people than you could physically one on one. And what you're describing yeah. is basically turning technology to replicate how you would respond. You know, if you were there right. sitting face to face with that person, you would talk to them differently if they were a man or a woman or all that stuff. I love that. That's well, you know, what's funny, Dow. To show everybody your audience how um, just how savvy you are, uh, that that was the that was the big idea behind the 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 funnel. We had a series of videos, you know, big you know, like a big uh, internal product launch, and what you just described was the exact big idea that I utilized when designing that campaign. That it, it was like this idea of like, look, we all know how much higher conversion conversions are when a prospect meets with a salesperson, right? Like Salesforce. Came out with a stat that it's between 20 and 40 percent and so i'm not saying that anybody's going to experience a 20 20 to 40 percent conversion rate but how much higher than the typical two or three percent or even four percent would your conversion rate go if you had a, a real live interactive dynamic responsive attentive salesperson that was doing all of your marketing and selling for you well a smart funnel is the closest thing that we have today to that experience yeah that's awesome so, that's, so yeah. kudos Kudos to you, man, for for nailing. Uh, just you know, shows everybody how savvy you really are, man. <laughs> well, no, no, I just stand on people like your shoulders. That's that's really that's it. And so, <laughs> not at all, dude. Believe me, I, I I've learned uh, listening to your podcast, man. I, I enjoy it, and you are absolutely. Uh, I wouldn't be here if you weren't um, a savvy marketer, dude. And so, for everybody listening, man, believe me, I've just been at this game a long time, and so the thing that I bring to the table that really anybody else in everybody else listening has the same opportunity uh, uh, um, to leverage and that's just experience that's that's all it is right and let me and I think that might be a great way for us to to start to wrap up there's so much more that I I could share and would love to share but I'll, I'll say this that you know that don't ever I, I can I can speak for myself I can't speak for you Daryl so I'll, I'll speak for myself for everybody don't look at me or any other top marketer, this is my opinion now, don't look at me or any other top top marketer as this marketing genius or bringing this level of intelligence to the table that you don't um, that you don't have. I can speak for myself, and I can speak for many of the marketers that uh, that I I consider friends. That I don't bring anything 
um, innate to the table. Like I was a terrible student in high school and took me six years to graduate from college. And I got like an 860 on the SATs and, and, uh, you know, which if, if those of you who know anything about the SATs know that it like starts at 600 and goes up to like 1500 or something. When I was younger, I was diagnosed with a learning disability. And so I didn't read a, a, a book cover to cover until I was like in my twenties. And so I, I share that because like, you've got the same opportunity like it just you've got to be diligent you've got to be a serious student of this business you've got to be willing to put in the time you certainly should be um willing to work with a mentor um like somebody like daryl um and um who can kind of help you avoid the 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 pits and the the mines you know the minefields out there but recognize that with time, with study, with due diligence, and with practice, um, you can develop the chops. I believe personally, just from my own experience and that of many of my friends, that marketing is a learned skill. It's not like, you know, I used to think, you know, these these advertising folks behind, you know, in these rooms, all creative geniuses that, you know, like they were just naturally, innately creative. That might be the case in that world, but in the direct response world, I believe that it is, it consists and it's made up of learned skills. And so you can learn them uh, and develop them you just need to decide that that's what you're going to do Todd that was awesome you can just drop the mic and walk away now that's <laughs> <laughs> exactly like Eminem 50 cent boom <laughs> thank you podcast crew good night boom that's it so Todd, yeah. how do we get in touch with you? How do people? You've got so much knowledge, um, I, and, and experience, and everything you, spe- you you say just rings with truth. How do anyone that wants to follow you or get in touch with you? How do they reach out to you? What are the best ways to contact you? Yeah, so there's two ways. One, I think that everybody listening should go check out. Uh, a free video series that I have. It does lead to a product, but the video series, the free video series is better than lots of paid funnel trainings. And you can find it at six, uh, six figure funnel formula.com. That's S I X. So six, figure funnel formula.com just opt in you'll go through an awesome training video i think there are something like i don't even know seventeen thousand likes and like 800 and some odd comments on that on that series and it's just uh it's it's stellar the other place is you can go to our, our blog at uh, marketing funnel automation.com forward slash blog and we got a bunch of articles and videos and training that that uh that really is more uh i don't want to say advanced but it's definitely you know it's for the serious entrepreneur like you said at the beginning Daryl, the the serious marketer who's looking to build a real deal reliable consistent sustainable um business um those are the two places man yeah perfect all right so we had six figure funnel formula.com that's s-i-x and it was marketing funnel automation dot com i get that right yep okay perfect yeah and definitely go check this out and i know the four videos you're talking about i didn't watch all of them but i remember i was launching a course and i did some look at your stuff those are really well done videos so i definitely encourage you to go check that out six figure funnel formula dot com and marketing funnel automation dot com todd thank you so much for your time today i appreciate you so much is there anything i didn't ask you that i should have asked you Oh my gosh. I we'll have to save that for part <laughs> two. How about that? We will leave this as, as part one um and we'll come back for part two. Yeah, because I think that there there's a couple things. I, I would love to just share with your your folks um the whole idea of pricing, right? Do you use do you start with a low price product and then go up, or do you start with a high price product and go down? I think that we should talk about um certainly the uh uh, developing an idea behind your marketing funnel because I think that most people skip the what I believe is the most critical part of designing a funnel, which is, you know, how do you develop the idea behind the message that you're actually going to communicate throughout the funnel, right? It's not like, you know, most people get caught up in the tactics like, all right, so should I have a tripwire and then should I have an upsell and then a downsell and and blah, blah, blah. And they, they miss the whole strategic element of designing the message. What they're going to, what are they going to say to get the market's attention, keep engagement, um, say something new, different, unique, and fresh to the market. How do you understand um, what idea um, meets that criteria and what idea doesn't? 
Um, and so, yeah, there's a bunch more that we can chat about, and, and it would be my pleasure to, to do that. I, I so appreciate you bringing me on here, and I so appreciate the opportunity to share my craziness with, uh, with, you, with your tribe that is uh, clearly from, uh, from listening to your podcast, man, is a, is a savvy group. And as a fan of, of your show, uh, yeah, man, it was an honor to be on here, dude. Thank you. You've reached the end of our interview. Now first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you. Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website, bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. Uh, you're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.